Right, well, this morning I want to come back to the uh, book of Ruth. We're actually at chapter 1, verse 16, which is up on the, uh, the screen there. And uh, it introduces us to Ruth's beautiful words of commitment, which have been an inspiration to many throughout the ages, and because of which the, the book and Ruth are so well known. I think it would be true to say that Ruth's words of commitment are really among the most exquisite expressions of love and loyalty that you could find in the Bible. And uh, for which reason there are a, a number of songs that um, are based on those words that are, that are sung in the churches, including ourselves. It's at this point that one can really see the wisdom of God in choosing Ruth to be an ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ, a contributor, as we know, to the messianic uh, gene pool, you know, that genetic structure that God was building in that holy genealogical line which culminated in our Lord Jesus Christ. But I think it would be a mistake to limit Ruth's words of commitment only to her relation with Naomi, her mother-in-law, and leave it at that. I believe that the principles involved in Ruth's words <clears throat> of commitment can be applied to the Christian commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, also the commitment of husbands and wives to each other in marriage. The whole story of Ruth should not be confined to history. Uh, it has deeper, it has wider applications beyond the story itself. You know, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, that all these things, that is, all these things that have been written and recorded in the Old Testament happened um, to them for examples or types, and they are written there for our admonition. So starting at the verse 16, these words of commitment, she says to her mother-in-law, and remember the story, um, Naomi, the mother-in-law, is leaving the land of Moab, going back to the land of Israel. Ruth, a non-Israelite, a Moabite, wants to go back to the land of Israel with her. Naomi initially doesn't want her to come with her to the land of Israel. And, uh, and so um, Ruth says to her, Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you. That word entreat is actually quite a strong word. It means um, to urge. To, to beg, uh, to implore, to plead. It, it has the idea of pressure, of, of pressing. Naomi's request for Ruth to go back to the land of Moab was obviously not just a mild, casual suggestion. Naomi um, was being quite forceful. She was being quite assertive in telling her daughter-in-law not to follow her. But uh, in spite of this, Ruth was not intimidated. She was not discouraged um, by it, even though Naomi pressured her or entreated her four or five times. Ruth's response was basically, don't urge me, don't pressure me to leave you and to go back. I'm not going. I'm not leaving you. I'm staying with you. Her love and commit commitment was very, very deep, very strong. There's no way that she was going to turn back and leave Naomi. She obviously had great faith. She had hope. She had courage. She had tenacity. She had patience. She had endurance. All the qualities and virtue that are required by us to qualify as a child of God and as a friend and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ to enable us to keep following him and not turn our back on him in spite of the circumstances in life that might seemingly be pressuring us to turn away and to go back into the world. Ruth's stubborn and tenacious commitment is also a good example, I believe, of the kind of commitment that should exist between husbands and wives. Whatever pressures, Whatever problems, whatever discouragements and disappointments arise in a marriage, and they do, our attitude should not be a defeatist one. 
that, you know, quickly and easily tosses in the towel and walks out and walks away. No, it should be Ruth's attitude. The attitude should be, I will not leave you. I will not return from following you. I'm not going to back off. I'm sticking with you and I'm going to continue through with this relationship. As we read in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. It's kind. It's not easily offended. It's not easily provoked. It's tolerant in all things. It hopes for all things. It endures all things. That's what the agape love is all about. Love persists, you see. It perseveres. And it is the key. It really is the key to lasting commitment because it is not easily daunted and it's not easily defeated. Ruth, of course, was not the first or the last biblical character to manifest a stubborn, persistent commitment. In my previous talk, I drew attention to that Syrio-Phoenician woman who asked Jesus to heal her daughter, um, and Jesus didn't seem to want to do it. He sort of discouraged her, in fact, but she persisted, she persevered, and she came back at him four times until in the end he said what great faith she had. In Luke chapter 18, we read that Jesus spoke a parable to teach us to keep on praying and not to lose heart, not to be discouraged by discouraging circumstances. And the parable related to a widow who was seeking justice from a judge, uh, but he was ignoring her requests. And we have that experience sometimes. It seems God, God is just ignoring us. He is the judge. He's a righteous judge, of course. And sometimes it seems that he is ignoring it. But this woman, she wouldn't take no for an answer. She wouldn't back off. She persisted, resulting in him, in the end, granting her request. Remember the case of Jacob, where an angel approached him in the night and uh, I think that he thought it was Esau, who he was afraid of, and um, he started fighting, wrestling with an angel. Eventually, he realized it was God. When I say God, you know what I mean. It was God's representative. It was as good as God. And, um, and, and this happens sometimes. We end up wrestling with God. We, we end up in, in situations where... We're, we're sort of fighting against him, but we don't realize sometimes it's a person we've got an issue with and we're fighting with them and we fail to realize it's actually God. It's actually God in that situation teaching us something, developing us in some way. And so it was with Jacob. He thought he was fighting with man, but no, it was God that he was fighting with. And in the end, when the penny dropped and when he realized that his battle actually was with God, he, he said, um, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And, uh, and that was the case. In 2 Samuel 15, we read that story there when David fled from Jerusalem due to his son Absalom's rebellion. His friend Ittai wanted to follow him, but David tried to discourage him from doing so. Um, Ittai was a, a Gittite. He was a, a foreigner. He was a non-Israelite. And it seems that David felt, well, he shouldn't have to get mixed up in this thing to do with us Israelites. And uh, so he wanted him to be sort of let off the hook and not have to suffer the deprivations that uh, David was going to suffer as a result of having to flee from, uh, from Jerusalem. But Ittai's response was, quote, Your Majesty, I swear to you in the Lord's name that wherever you go, even if it means death, I will go with you. What a beautiful example of loyalty and commitment that was. And I, I can see this as a sort of a type and a foreshadow of the, the, the Gentile commitment to the Lord, which happened in later times. In 2 Kings chapter 2, we read that Elijah told Elisha to stay behind at Gilgal while he went ahead to Bethel. But Elisha said to him, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. 
Again, another example of tenacious loyalty and commitment. We all know the stories in the book of Daniel, how that in the early part of Daniel, when the king of, Bab king of Babylon required Daniel and his friends to eat food that was regarded by them as defiled by God's law, they refused to back off. They stuck to their guns and they remained totally, fully, 100% committed to the Lord and the ways of the Lord. When Daniel's three friends were told they're going to be cast in a fiery furnace if they um, refused to worship that idol that the king set up, what was their response? They didn't back off either. They stuck to their guns and remained faithful to the Lord. When Daniel knew that he would be cast into the lion's den, if he kept praying to his God, he was of the same spirit. He refused. He refused to stop praying to his God. These are examples of the same tenacious resolve of Ruth, who refused to turn back following Naomi. She refused to, to, to not make Israel's God her God. You remember Elijah when he prayed for rain and it didn't come. He refused to take no for an answer. He prayed again and again and again, seven times. He wasn't going to back off, persistent, tenacious, persevering. He prayed seven times. I remember years and years and years ago when I was reading, actually reading that story um, about Elijah and I got a phone call from John Smith to say that Isaac wouldn't wake up. No matter what they did, shook him, talked to him, shouted at him, he wouldn't wake up. And they were very concerned. Um, the immediate response is to rush off to the doctor or hospital, but they wanted to commit it to the Lord first. And so I said, I'll, I'll come over. And so we prayed. We laid hands, we anointed him with oil, we prayed, and nothing happened. And I said, I've just been reading about Elijah. And uh, he prayed seven times, so let's keep praying. Would you, believe, would you believe it? We did actually pray seven times. And on the seventh time, he woke up. Amazing. Yeah, it was quite, the, ti the timing of that was quite amazing. When the Lord told Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, he was going to die, um, did he just resign himself to it and think, oh, well, whatever, you know? Uh, no. He entreated the Lord, entreated, same word used up there. He entreated the Lord and he lived for another 15 years. His patient, persistent prayer paid off as it always does. So in verse 16, coming back to that verse, Ruth said to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Ruth's love for her mother-in-law was such that she was willing to leave her country, leave her home, leave her family and friends and travel into another foreign country which she'd never seen before, a country, in fact, that was hostile to her own country. She doesn't care where Naomi lives or where, she, where she, she's going to go with her. You know, there are Christians also whose love for Jesus is such that they have been willing to leave their country, their home, their family to preach the gospel in foreign, hostile countries in response to the commission of Jesus to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel to all nations. And likewise, there have been wives whose love and commitment to their husband has been such that they've left, their, left the country, left their home, left their family to be with their husband due to him being called away. And there have been cases I've read of where the husband points out all the disadvantages that are going to be involved and the wife says, entreat me not to leave you. Entreat me not to leave you and stop following you. Where you go, I will go. You remember the case of Rebecca, lived up in Syria and it was time for Isaac to get a wife and Abraham sent his servant Eliezer up there to get a wife and uh, he, um, his paths crossed with, with Rebecca and uh, he had the witness that she was the one and uh, it was quite, quite a thing for her 
to, to actually leave her country, leave her family, leave her culture, leave all that behind in order to go the way of the Lord and to be linked up with Isaac, who was a type of Christ, of course, but she, um, she, di um, she did that. <clears throat> there have been cases of a husband who had a good job, good salary, modern house, all the mod cons, very, very comfortable, very secure, who responded to the call to go out to the mission field to poor, backward country, which involved an immediate drop in standard of living, but also the wife still insisted on going with him. Firstly, because she knew it was God's will, and secondly, because she loved her husband and didn't want to be parted from him. There are many examples of that same sort of commitment that we're talking about. You know, were it not for such people with a selfless sacrificial spirit, willing to put the Lord's service before and above their own pleasure and profit and comfort, millions and millions of people would never ever have got to hear the gospel. And the challenge to us, of course, is how much? How much are we willing to give up of our time and our effort, um, expense and support for the proclamation of the truth locally, <laughs> let alone overseas. Remember what Jesus said, everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children or country for my namesake shall receive a hundred times more and will be given eternal life. It's like he said on another occasion, seek ye first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Ruth went on to say to Naomi, where you lodge, that is where you live, I will lodge. So Ruth is, is willing, she expects to live with Naomi. Um, knowing what we know about Ruth, I would see, see Naomi is getting, she's not a young woman anymore, she's getting old. And I, I think that, the, that you can draw out of this um, Ruth's willingness to be a caregiver, to be a caregiver for her um, ageing mother-in-law. And, and it seems that Ruth doesn't care. She doesn't care what sort of house or accommodation that she's going to end up in. She doesn't ask Naomi, well, listen, uh, before I sort of commit myself, can you sort of give me some idea what your house is like? You know, um, is it is it well well equipped? Is, you know, it hasn't got a leaking roof, has it, or rot on the floors, or it doesn't ask anything about what condition that you know. She doesn't care. She doesn't really care as long as she can be with her with her mother mother-in-law. You know, many missionaries have learned that they have to be prepared to lodge in or visit places where the Lord intends to dwell. And, uh, and that he's not a respecter of places. He's not a respecter of persons, yes. He's not a respecter of places either. The Lord's not the kind of person who's only willing to go into, in, in, into flash modern houses, you know, um, and, and who wouldn't want to go into any sort of a dirty dustbin kind of a, kind of a place. He's not a respecter of, of places at all. I recall a story um, of a missionary who was asked to visit a native village and pray for a sick man there. And the, the native was inside this dirty, smelly, fly-infested hut. The smell almost made him want to vomit. He just didn't want to go in. He expected the Lord to go in. He expected the Lord to be in there to answer the prayer and to heal the man, but he didn't want to go in himself. So he stood outside the door and he prayed. And he prayed, Lord, would you touch this man and heal him? And a still, small voice came to him and said, if you won't go in there, why should I? If I'm prepared to go in there and minister that man's needs, well then, so should you. And uh, I'm not saying it was the, the Lord himself actually saying that, but uh, I think his conscience, uh, his conscience was pricking him. And th those were the thoughts that came into his mind um, as he stood outside that hut, not wanting to go in. You know, if ever we hesitate or balk 
at visiting a certain place or lodging at a certain place, remember commitment to the Lord requires lodging where he lodges, going where we expect him to go. And he's no respecter of persons or places. Even Jesus said, you know, young man came out and said, oh Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And he said, well, foxes have got holes and birds have got nests, but I, I've got nowhere definite to lay my head. In other words, if you want to follow me, don't expect you're going to get five-star accommodation every night. Don't expect you're going to get five-course meals every night. The chances are you might have to sleep with me under a bush or under a tree. Uh, and, that, and Jesus was happy to do that, quite happy to do that. He didn't stand on ceremony. He wasn't the kind of person that just wanted luxury and, and the latest and the modern things um, to be interested in ministry. And of course, the same principle applies in relation to the lodging place of Christian married couples. I remember when Anne and I were courting and uh, travelling along the highway between New Plymouth and Whanganui, because at the time she was living um, in New Plymouth and I used to travel frequently between the two, between the two towns. And uh, I don't know about now, because I haven't been up that way for a long time, but in those days, as you travel on that road, on that road there, you, you pass a number of old, broken down, dil, dil, um, dilapidated farmhouses, obviously deserted, and I remember jokingly saying to Anne once, I said, you know, we might end up having to live in a place like that. And uh, I don't know if she remembers or not, but I remember she said, she said to me, well, I wouldn't mind as long as we are together. First love's a wonderful thing, you know. <laughs> uh, sometimes it doesn't always last, but it's a wonderful thing while it, uh, while it does last. I mean, after nearly... 60 years of marriage now, I don't, I don't know if she'd still feel the same way at the prospect of living in such a place, um, not to mention myself. But as it turned out, um, I won some, my building society shares the ballot, the one, one, and we were able to purchase a house for ourselves. But we were pretty naive, pretty green in those days, and uh, they didn't have limb reports and, and all of that. And um, so we, we bought this place. It was quite old. And it turned out, unbeknown to us, it had rot in the front bedroom floors. It smelt musty. Um, some of the windows jammed. They wouldn't open. And these wriggly things came out of the water, out of the, out of the tank. Obviously, th these things were annoying and had to be attended to, but we were happy. We were happy in ourselves. Our heart had been given to the Lord and he really was our joy. His kingdom was our hope and we believed the Lord's coming was just around the corner. We uh, read his word every evening, prayed together, listened to spiritual music. No TV, no distractions like that in, in those days. But um, we couldn't have been happier or, or more content in a modern, flash, expensive house. We didn't need luxury lodging to be happy. I think in those days we could have lived in a tent. There is a saying, you can build a house with nails, but you can't build a home with nails. You can build a house with nails, but you build a, ha a home with love. And where true home is, true love will be. And do you know some of the happiest marriages, some of the happiest families lodge in humble, modest, unpretentious dwellings. Some of the unhappiest marriages are in expensive, elaborate mansions. Hollywood is full of such mansions and it's full of such unhappy, broken marriages. Yes, the Bible is true when it says godliness with contentment is of great gain. I, I know there have been cases of wives who leave their husbands because he fails to build them the dream house that they want. They become discontented living in the same old ordinary house while other more modern flasher houses are going up around them. Or worse still, the case of a wife who runs off with another man because he has more money, flash a house, and flash a car, etc. You know, in some cases, discontent 
or lust for luxury has taken the place of love and loyalty and commitment. It is so true when the Bible says godliness with contentment is of great gain. You see, discontent basically means being dissatisfied, wanting more and better than what you have. Now, that can be a, a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. I mean, it can have a positive or a negative twist to it, all depending on what we want more of and why we want more of. For example, it's a good thing to want to be a better person. It's a good thing to want to be more like Christ. It's a good thing to want to spend more time praying and reading the word and gaining knowledge um, of the word. We sing that song, I want more, more of you. Really? You ever think about that? Really? I want more, more? Is that what we want more of? Or are we really, in our heart, more preoccupied with more of the material things of this life which can't give us what the Lord is able to provide. But it can be a not so good thing to want more and more money to buy bigger and better things if, if the getting of that necessitates neglecting spiritual commitments and the Lord. I mean, there is nothing wrong with wanting more money there's nothing wrong in wanting maybe a better house or a better car. We all do that. We all experience that. That's, that's okay. It only becomes wrong when we do it at the expense of our commitment um, and of our standard of spirituality. Because it's like Jesus said in that parable of the sower, the four different grounds on which the seed fell. And one of them, the seed, the good seed, the word of God, it was planted in this ground where thorns and thistles grew up. And the thorns and thistles uh, choked and, and suffocated the plant. It destroyed the plant. And, and, and that's what can happen. Jesus explained it. He says that that land, that ground where those thorns and thistles come, he said that represents people who receive the word of God and it and it grows and it starts to become a plant, but then they allow their love for money, their desire for riches, their desire for luxury, their desire for more and more and more material things, they allow that to encroach in their lives to the point where it, where it throttles to death, where it suffocates their spirituality, and that is the danger of it. For this reason, Paul wrote these words. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world. It's certain we don't carry anything out. Tutankhamun's tomb is an example of that. So if we have food and clothing, we should be content. But those who covet to be rich fall into temptation and are caught in the trap of many foolish and harmful lusts which plunge and drown them into ruin and destruction. Because the love of money is the root of all evil. Notice, it's not money that's the problem, it's the love. It's the love of it. The love of money is the root, that is the source, the cause of all evil. Some have been so eager to have it that they have wandered and drifted away from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows, that is, ended up in a sorrowful state. But you, O child of God, avoid and shun all these things. Pursue and strive for righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. We read in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Let your life be without covetousness. Be content with the things you have for God has promised that he will never leave or forsake you. And of course, the Apostle Paul was not the kind of person of whom it could be said, well, do as he says, but don't do as he does. Uh, no, Paul lived, as did Jesus, by the same rules that he preached. We read in Philippians that Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am, that is, whatever the circumstances are in my life, I've learned 
to be content. But coming back to the subject of lodging, that is accommodation, um, calls to mind God's friend Abraham. Because we read that by faith he sojourned in the land of promise, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. Because he looked, that is, his hope and expectation was for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, there were cities, there were houses in the land that Abraham could have lived in instead of living in tents, but he preferred to um, wait for the city, the house built by God, which it says has foundations. A city that cannot be shaken. That's what, I mean, all cities have got foundations. And sometimes you might say, well, tell me something new. God's city's got foundation. Well, so have other, so have other cities. But in the context, what it's saying is that the, the city has foundations that cannot be shaken. The, the, city, the foundations of all the cities built by man can be shaken. We see it on TV when earthquakes occur, how they, they crumble and they fall and end up as a, as a, a, heap, of, um, a heap of dust. So Abraham looked for the city of God because it can't be destroyed, it can't be shaken um, on the judgment day, which is going to happen, as we know, to all cities and houses on the planet. Revelation 16 very clearly says when the Lord comes back, there is going to be an, uh, an earthquake of unprecedented magnitude. It's an earthquake that's not just going to shake a particular city or country. The whole planet is going to be shaken. And it says that all the cities, all the cities on the planet are going to fall. They're going to collapse. They're going to end up um, a pile of dust and, uh, and rubble. But the city of God won't. It will remain intact. In we read in Hebrews 13 verse 14 that here, here, that is on earth, we have no continuing or lasting city, but we do seek one to come. For this reason, Abraham, it seems, was not fussed about what type of lodging he lived in knowing that all the cities and houses were going to be destroyed anyway and that God's house was far more superior, far more enduring than anything that man can build. You know, it's a very sobering thought to consider the houses that we live in at the moment, no matter how large, no matter how flash, no matter how expensive, they are all destined to be destroyed. They're all destined to collapse and end up a pile of useless rubble and ashes. Peter says in his epistle, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with intense heat, the earth also and the works that is, all material things made by man shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, think what sort of persons you ought to be in all holy conduct and godliness. <clears throat> Knowing this, it is sad to see so many, particularly in the world, who are so totally preoccupied and obsessed with their houses that they have no time, they have no interest in the house of God or in the city of God that he has promised. Even in Haggai's day, the church in Haggai's day went down this track. They were totally preoccupied with their own material houses while the, the house of God was neglected. They'd come back from Babylon to rebuild the house of God and... Um, they only put, laid the foundation, they did, nothing, they, they did nothing else. They started getting involved doing their own houses and paneling them with cedar and getting all caught up in doing that and God's house was totally neglected. And there's a theme in Haggai's, um, the little um, two-chapter book in Haggai where the prophet says, consider now your ways. It's a refrain, consider now your ways. It's, it's like he's saying, hey, 
Is it right? Is it really right for you to be so preoccupied with your house and setting yourself up and doing all this while God's house is being neglected and you're not caring about that and you don't care about it being completed and, and being um, properly structured? It's not difficult to imagine the weeping and the gnashing that will take place when people, as is going to happen, will be left on earth <clears throat> with their houses in ruins and they will see God's house, his city, his holy city, descending from heaven in all of its power and glory and splendor, and they realize they could be in it. They could be lodging in that forever if they'd got their priorities right. Jesus warned there is going to be those who will, will weep and gnash because they got it wrong. They got their priorities wrong. But it's also not difficult to imagine the joy and the ecstasy that will be experienced when our guardian angel comes to us uh, on that day, as he will, and says to us, well done, you good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord, and then takes us up to meet the Lord in the air and probably ushers us in to that city which is descending at the time. What a contrast. What a contrast will be seen on that day of the Lord's return between those who were serious about their commitment and those who weren't. And as the saying go, goes, the ball is always in our court. You see, there is nothing more the Lord can do for us. Nothing. He's done it all. The ball is entirely in our court and we can choose to play ball or not. And one thing is certain, no excuse to refuse to play ball will cut it with him.